It's the reason girls practice all our lives to play with dolls. <laughs> <laughs> Underline the word dolls, eh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, we've got to have some fun. Checking now on, uh, on live stream. Checking now, please. Okay, we're online, guys. All right, we are online. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome this evening to our breakthrough generation, leaving no one behind. And um, for those of you that have been following us, uh, you would see how we've just navigated through all these weeks and God just depositing us, uh, depositing into our spirits week after week and how we continue to just keep building. So thank you for joining us. We want to welcome our special guests, Dishani and Joshua. We are so privileged and honored to have you guys share with us this evening. I'm sure we're going to be blessed by your story. I always say to Nishani, I think if you have to write a story, it will not just only be the bestseller, but it will be, I don't know how many pages that story will be able to be written upon. Um, then we also want to welcome Tabo this evening. Thank you so much for joining with us and our co-host, Pastor Shailen Singh. It's such a honor to have you guys on this platform. To all our viewers, thank you for tuning in. I'm sure God's going to bless us. Please feel free to comment. Uh, be part of our conversation. We learn and we grow together. So thank you. Just open up your hearts, open up your spirits, because uh, we want to become better and become the best. And these are the platforms of how uh, we will grow together and how we will forge a path to keep moving stronger and finishing strong together. So God bless you this evening. Yeah, good, good evening, everyone. A, a warm welcome. Um, it's good to have everyone, and especially uh, Pastor Shailen, our co-host, um, together with our guest uh, this evening. Um, so welcome. It's good to have everyone. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Shailen to just introduce um, Tabo and Shlobo to us. Um, uh, we, we, we are so glad to have him. Um, so he, Pastor Shailen is going to introduce him as uh, one of our guests um, and, uh, and introduce our, our discussion. We're going to keep on uh, living for a cause. Uh, Pastor Shailen, over to you. Well, a very good evening to the panel uh, this evening. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, we want to greet, uh, uh, say a very good evening to all our online viewers. Uh, um, it depends on what time of the day you're watching this, but uh, we just want to greet you and uh, say to you, it's good to have you online uh, on this platform, which is focused on a transgenerational mandate for succession, uh, leaving nobody behind. And in the time of COVID, uh, it may sound like a paradox that we cannot leave people behind, but uh, this is our intention uh, to ensure that you understand the purpose and the primary assignment of why you were conceived. And I, I, I'm reminded, uh, I've been focusing on the profile of Jeremiah and Jeremiah chapter one, it says, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I called you by name as a prophet to the nation, to uproot, to tear down, to build and to plant. So the prophetic profile from a priestly family, Jeremiah emerges to fulfill a prophetic mandate. And his life uh, is, um, if you study the profile and uh, the the, the character, you will find that his life uh, has been accompanied by numeric, uh, numerous sufferings uh, uh, because the people would not receive him. So a lot of our lives sometimes are, are tarnished by suffering, but we've got to look at the bigger picture and look for the purpose behind the challenge. And so uh, wherever you're tuning in from online, I believe that God has a purpose. One of the prophetic impressions I've received in the season is that uh, from Jeremiah chapter 12 again, that if we cannot go battle where we would with foot soldiers, how will we run with horses? And for me, yeah. it's very paradoxical because in the natural, it may seem impossible, but we're living from eternity and we are embracing an eternal paradigm, although we live in the natural. So God's looking for you online viewers to fulfill purpose, to fulfill reason. I'll get our, our colleagues on the platform. 
platform to Russell. So that means that you have capacity developed all through your life and God has capacitated you for the assignment that he's entrusting you. And we're not talking about church here, but we talk about every domain. We're talking about the spheres of influence. And also with that capacity to run with horses, you now have the ability for acceleration in the midst of COVID-19. And um, pictures of acceleration are Elijah outrunning Ahab's chariot, uh, very, very powerful with horsepower in the spirit. And other pictures are that of Jehu riding furiously to dismantle an Ahab dynasty and Jezebelian system. So let's, let's come back to a cause. These individuals that I cited had amazing cause in the midst of great adversity, they thrive. And so our hosts are gonna bring a wealth of information tonight uh, on this platform to just encourage us. We wanna welcome Tabo. Uh, we met uh, on an, uh, at parliament actually in parliamentary prayer. And then subsequently we've been connecting online and he's the founder of Daddy Please Come Home. I really love that because part of next year, uh, part of this platform is about the family. It's about an absent father, fatherless generation coming back home. He's also the founder of Invest Group, the founder and team leader of the new economy, the founder and, uh, uh, of Think and Create Legacy Education. He's an author, a dad, a coach, and a keynote speaker, as well as an entrepreneur. So a very good evening, sir, and welcome to this online platform. Good evening, and uh, so excited to really uh, be here once again. Uh, I'm getting used to these uh, online platforms. Uh, I guess uh, if I guess we can see the other side of COVID-19 as a blessing in disguise, uh, yeah. because we kept, we kept saying we're going to connect, connect. Eventually, uh, we ended up connecting during yeah. lockdown. So I'm excited yeah. and uh, and good evening also Shane family and also uh, also uh, is it Nishan Ford also. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Yeah. Yeah, it's great that we connected online. Uh, you know, COVID-19, yeah, we must believe that in, in this paradox, there's there amazing things manifesting innovatively. So yes, back to you, Pastor Shane. Yeah, um, so Tabo, welcome. Uh, and you know, we, we, we realize that you have such a grace on your life. Um, uh, we, we realize that there, there is a resource within you. Um, and God's connecting for a season like this. And we wanted to obviously share that resource with all of our viewers. And so, um, and we're talking about, we're talking about being cause driven. Um, and, and, you know, when you look, when we look at your profile, we look at so many um, aspects that you're busy with, um, sure. you know, found of this, found of that, uh, so many causes that you have, uh, that you have started to raise uh, a voice towards and started to um, um, move towards. Um, and so maybe if you can just talk to us a little bit before we get to uh, Nishani and Joshua, uh, maybe, um, um, maybe talk to us a little bit about your past um, and, and how um, you started to transition and, and what, was the, what was the determining factor that made you such a, uh, a founder? Can I put it that way? Uh, founding grace, uh, establishing <laughs> the foundation for the next generation, um, like like um, like Isaiah fifty eight speaks about, uh, verse twelve. So maybe talk talk to us about maybe just give us a brief history about yourself, Tabo, and how this whole um, entrepreneur in you started to rise up, uh, becoming that cause driven uh, individual. Uh, how did that start to rise up within you? Well, uh, thank you once again for that uh, question and the privilege to share my story. Um, look, I, I never really wanted to do any of the things I'm doing. Uh, in fact, uh, I, 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 I look back you know, over the years and, uh, and, I, and I will have this chat with my wife, especially yesterday night, I was just chatting with her saying, I feel like I'm living in a movie, you know, it's, I don't understand what's going on sometimes, but at least the movie looks good on the people that are watching it, you know, I don't get it a ton. Uh, I come from uh, Newcastle, where I am right now, I'm originally from here, uh, I was born here in Newcastle and I mean, I studied here and when I finished my studies here, I went to Pretoria, 
where I did my higher education. And it was in Pretoria around about 2004 where I was introduced to, to the gospel. And obviously as an academic intellectual, I mean, I, I, I really, uh, I, found, uh, I found preachers very, uh, and for me, it was like, uh, can there be someone who's, re you know, rational, you know, who can really, you know, explain, you know, properly. And, and luckily I found someone who was able to articulate the gospel he wasn't vibrating at the pulpit. He wasn't, you know, spitting. He was really communicating the message, <laughs> you know, and it made sense, you know. And uh, and and I and I and, I, and, I, and there wasn't like an angel, like something, you know. And and I committed, and uh, and then from there, it was really a journey of really fast forwarding. And uh, uh, within a year, two thousand and five, you know, I then had a call to to ministry. You know, just within a year after that, I felt I had a call to ministry and, uh, and, and I, I really started speaking and I started having a passion for people. Mind you, I was doing my accounting science and I lost the passion for accounting science. I was growing more into people. And from there, that's when I came to Devon, spent some time in Devon, worked with uh, Campus Crusade on campus, UK Zavan, uh, Westville. And... Uh, with some other organization. And that's when then I think my ministry training, but then again, when I moved back to Joburg in 2008, I felt there was something missing because I'd been involved with the churches. And that's when the whole passion for marketplace, you know, came in where, you know what, I, 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 I started working in the bank and I started realizing that there's a field that is not reached, which is the, the marketplace, you know, where there's a lot of people who haven't heard about the gospel or either they have heard about the gospel, but they're struggling to integrate their faith with what they're doing. And that's when my, my heart was there. And, and, and that's really where I started getting involved more with other different leaders in terms of education, in terms of other things. So to, to really found something was not my idea. Uh, it was because circumstances uh, forced me. I think within me, there's always been a seed of justice, a sense of uh, I hated injustice, but it was just hidden. And uh, I think when in the bank where I was, where I realized that there was an injustice, you know, against certain uh, employees and I stood up for it. And, and that was the end of my, my job. And even on another finance company that I was in, when I stood up for injustice, I was escorted by security outside the building 2012. And that was the last time I was on the job. And so <laughs> since then, I was forced then to start something, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and this is how from 2009, we pioneered a movement called LCB in Africa, which was just a, a network for professionals, you know, just on how to live out your faith in the workplace. By 2012, it had gained momentum but it was still something just, you know, strange for a lot of my friends who were in the faith. Some felt that I'd backslidden because I was no longer, you know, going by the title pastor. I was more into, you know, spaces where nobody would want to. And I think from there, we cut up the momentum up until really 2016 when I wrote the book, The New Economy, trying to respond to the economic situation of the country that there is a better way. And that book, eventually led me to, to Steve Swart in 2017. We launched the book in parliament. And from there, it became a very, like a wildfire. And that's when we started connecting. And I think from there, I then started pioneering quite a number of things because I knew there was an influence upon my life. And there was a sense of uh, social justice and economic justice that I wanted to, to see happening uh, in our communities, and that's how this was better. Yeah. I say that um, it's, it's 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 been a long journey, um, and and God's taken you um, to to amazing places and platforms, um, and and we thank God for where He's brought you to, and and especially obviously to this platform, um, so that you can just share a little bit. I, I want to bring um, Anishani and Joshua in. Um, at this stage. Um, and so I, I'd like our viewers to meet Nishani and Joshua. 
Um, and, you know, I just shared a post uh, before, about an hour ago, just to introduce our, our session tonight. And I talked about how this, this is a family who lived through 10 years of addiction, 22 failed overdoses, 11 months on the street, um, and now being three years uh, drug-free, um, as far as Joshua is concerned. Um, and it's a, it's a redemption story of God's grace and a transgenerational family living for a cause. Um, and what, you know, I was just sharing with them before we could start, I said this is one of those but God moments. Um, you know, when you hear their story, uh, what they've been through in, 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 in the last 10 years, and how God has preserved them, like, you know, we heard Tabo, um, how God has brought him through the different challenges um, as justice or injustices, and how he had to rise up in the midst of them. Um, and so uh, I want to welcome Nishani and, and Joshua to the platform. Um, and it's, it's so good to have you guys. Um, so I want to, um, uh, Nishani and, and Joshua have also founded uh, an organization called Wholehearted. Um, when you hear their story and where they've come from, you never think of, okay, these people are now going to go on and start to do something like start an organization or to uh, work for a cause or to, uh, because there's now a burning desire on the inside of them. And so they've, they've started an organization called Wholehearted. Um, Nishani also works for, um, for Oxfam, Oxfam. Um, she's the Global Safeguarding L&D Manager for Oxfam. Um, Oxfam is, uh, you, Tabo, you, I don't know if you know this, Oxfam is a social injustice organization. Um, and so they, they're working with, uh, uh, against vi over violence against women and children. Um, so they, 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 they have a big role to play uh, with the often vulnerable. Um, and I think they're, they're in like over 90 countries or something like that. But I want to hand over to Nishani and Joshua, bring them into the conversation, uh, welcome them first, and, uh, and ask them, both of them, if they could just quickly share a little bit of their background, um, you know, where they're coming from, some of the challenges they've had to go through. I just, you know, put it in three lines, basically, uh, but we're talking about 10 years of, uh, of facing uh, major mountains. Um, and so mom can share first, um, um, because... Obviously, she's had to deal with some stuff, and then Joshua can also share. Um, so, oh, if Joshua wants to go first. Joshua can go first, mm -hmm. and then Mom can come in. Um, but but I, um... we really like to hear uh, your story, um, yeah. and then we want to hear uh, what what caused you to then go and set up wholehearted. You know, uh, how do you move from the pain? the challenges, the struggles for 10 years, and, and then shift into now, uh, what, what was that transition moment and what caused that uh, to happen to now say, okay, we're gonna start this cause, we're gonna set on course uh, to do this in our community. Um, so over to Nishani and Joshua. Hi, um, good evening, everybody. I always knew I would have a, a son and I knew he, he would be Joshua. Um, when I was eight months pregnant, uh, I, it was such an unusual thing, but Joshua we used to kick so hard that he fractured a rib and I had to have complete bed rest. <laughs> to have complete bed rest. Um, and, you know, uh, I, was, we were, we were, I was in a marriage that was not great. Um, so in the, you know, all of his childhood, he's experienced uh, violence in the home. Um, and we've, we are, we've come out of an abusive background, every form of abuse. And then when Joshua was 12 years old, 10, 11, 12 years old, um, he went missing for two days. Um, he was 10, hey? yeah. He went missing for two days. And um, when we found him, um, he sat on my bed and he said to me the words that changed my life forever and, and brought us to this cause. He said to me, mom, I'm on heroin, please help me. And here I was looking at the face of this baby um, and that's, that's where the, the cause started. That's where the story started. But let Joshua fill you in on the details a little bit. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so my parents always had a broken relationship. Uh, my dad was always abusive. My mom always did the best she could. I mean, I never really knew that they had a broken marriage. 
always had put food on the table. We always had what we wanted and what we needed. Um, my dad was a very abusive person. He'd drink, he'd beat us up. If he was in a bad mood, he'd beat us up. So in turn, I was very, I externalized. I'd be mad at people. I'd get into fights at school. I think the first time my parents had to take me to the police station, I was about eight years old. I shoved the kid's head so far down the toilet that I had to remove the toilet to get his head out. And it was just that my dad had irritated me at home and I'd taken it out on someone at school. <laughs> and I remember the day I started doing drugs, uh, they had one of these drug ed talks at school. And my dad had beat me and my mom up that morning and he had told me a whole bunch of hurtful things. And they had done this drug ed talk and they had told us that heroin kills people the fastest. So after the drug ed talk, I went, I jumped the school gates and I made it my mission to find heroin. And that, that was my first overdose on that day. I mean, I was 10 years old and I put a needle in my arm. Um, I overdosed, I was robbed. I came home two days later. I told my parents I was on drugs. Obviously my mom being my mom, um, not wanting to really deal with the matter at the hand, uh, it was about what two years before I was put in. You know, you went to Sanka. You know? Oh, I went to Sanka. Um, but that didn't really stop anything. I mean, there I learned how to do more drugs, I learned more things. And my life spiraled out of control. I've been in and out of the justice system since I was about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I've been in and out of prison, in and out of rehab. Um, I've stolen everything from bread to cars. I've worked for horrible people. I've had gangsters and taxi drivers threatening my family, threatening my life for money I owe them. Uh, even when I came out of rehab, I had gangsters coming outside my house to come and give me guns, to come and give me drugs, to try and get me back into the life. Um, yeah, it, was, it had to have been my choice to quit the, that lifestyle. And it wasn't until the day I had a gun in my mouth and I was praying for my life and the gun jammed and I ran. And when I took the corner, the gun fired. And that same evening, I, I phoned my mom and I was like, okay, look, I need rehab. And that same day she managed to, she managed to come through and take me to rehab. And from then I was like, I'm done with this lifestyle and I haven't looked back. I just never looked back. And the fact that you found yourself so on Sundays? Yeah, even in my addiction, in my darkest of times, every Sunday I was sober, every Sunday I found myself in church. I think God somehow kept me alive in my addiction. I mean, there's no other way I could have been alive. Uh, I've been stabbed, I've been cut, I've been beat up, I've been jumped by gang members, I've been mob justice. Um, yeah, you name it, it's happened to me. Like I've been through the worst and yeah. I'm still standing. Like it's a bad God moment. Yeah. You know, that's so, that's so good to hear you're sharing your story uh, as a family because at GEMS Foundation, one of our arms is a rehabilitation facility and we've rehabilitated 180 young men. And many of them share your story, Joshua, uh, of a broken family which is a recipe for drug addiction, uh, especially with the rejection. Rejection is a very powerful tool of the enemy. And if it operates, then many things come into play. And there are many online viewers right now, including young people. Uh, if you are confronted by rejection, it's very important to deal with it. And uh, at GEMS, we've seen how uh, young people, some of them have recovered, and one of them is currently producing a song. It's so amazing. So we learn from your testimony. Thanks for coming out and sharing your story. And I think... Uh, uh, that's where Tabo can come in because uh, a fatherless home, so an absent present father, oftentimes we think uh, that a father is, is there, but he's present, but oftentimes it's an absent present father. We find that as a social dynamic, very real every day in the schools that we work in our city, we see this. And so what are your thoughts about uh, fatherlessness um, 
their tabo. That's why you wrote the book, Daddy Come Home. And a large part of the constituents of South Africa do not have a father figure. So the endemic problem of our nation is fatherlessness. And Tabo wrote an amazing resource there. And I love it. So maybe come in and introduce us to Daddy Come Back Home and how it interplays with this concept of fatherlessness. And uh, drug, uh, drug addiction is a huge problem in South Africa. There's more than 5 million users in South Africa. And it's escalated in the time of COVID-19. And uh, government is not doing sufficient. So NGOs, thank God for them, are coming on board. But also they make it very difficult with the uh, with the laws that social development uh, stipulates about how to run a rehab. So these are challenges mm. that we have. So we can talk about that. But thank you, Tabo. And uh, I want to commend you, Joshua. Just continue this journey. Continue your trajectory of faith. Stay in support. And uh, accountability is pivotal for the completion of your primary assignment. And I'm sure you can help many young South Africans with just sharing your story as a family. Sure. Oh. Um, thank you very much, Josh, for that story. And uh, I just also want to just commend you and also honor your mom just for really not giving up, you know, mm. on, on, on you and, and really walking with you. And, you know, it's funny. I've, I've got this book here. It's Daddy, Please Come Home. And uh, like I said, for me, you know, most of the things, you know, I will bump into them just by... You know, God, but I would say, I don't know what I say, accident or just God, just because, you know, um, after, after I'd launched my book, The New Economy, I was traveling, I was out of the country, I was in Rwanda, I was in Kenya, I was meeting this government. But, you know, uh, you know, um, and I think during that time, you know, I didn't realize how that that was putting also a strain on my family, although it wasn't showing. And, uh, but also on me health wise. And, and I realized that in 2018, that's when I think God was starting to pull the plug slowly to really help me to adjust. And uh, I mean, I survived almost, uh, almost four, four heart failures because of, you know, just business and uh, being over, overworked and, you know, on, you know, you're in demand, you know, you need it there, there, there nation building you know sometimes we say hey nation building we gotta do this we gotta do this i mean that was just that and uh and and, and, and i think my marriage you know started crumbling although it wasn't like full-blown but you could see that not there's a void even my children although i was there there was no sense of connection emotional connection and which is what i really want to focus on and so in December 2018, my wife and I went to a marriage conference in Rustenbeck, and that's when I was led to go to Marikana. So when I get to Marikana, then it's like the Holy Spirit was saying, the 48 men that died here, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, it wasn't just, it was an assault to family, you know, that yeah. their, their children will not have uh, 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 parents, and they are crying out saying, Daddy, please come home. And so that hit me that I went back home to my children and I, I had to make a, a, a promise to say, I'll never leave you. And I wrote my book on my birthday on the 7th of December and I, I launched it in January. And then from there, started a whole new total world in 2019, which I thought I, I'm going to go talk to men. I'm going to go do this. But God was wanting to make this book one with me. You know, so mm -hmm. I spent a year in Devon in, a, in one of the children's village, just walking with the children. And, and this is why I understood what was going on in the lives of the children and the men around the community. That emotional validation is so key that even when mm -hmm. your dad is around, I mean, my dad was around, you know, but he was busy, you know. And, and, and so, and, and things like emotional validation, such as, you know, connecting with you from a heart level, you know, having conversation, having, saying words such as, I love you, you know, mm -hmm. um, those, those are absence, those are things that you wouldn't hear because also men are disconnected because they, it's a legacy, it's a generational legacy of uh, hearts not tend to the sons and, and, and vice versa. So what I saw was that a lot of the children and a lot of the youth I met, even as I traveled to Drakenstein and I go to the prison, was that 
they had gone into drugs uh, as part of coping. You know, yeah. there was a, there was a void, there was a gap, and they were trying to fill this gap. Um, or, you know, and so they are looking for whatever they could find. So the, the the boys will look, they will go for drugs to to try and cope with the pain. So it's became a coping mechanism for them mm -hmm. to either go into drugs, some they went into pornography. And, and if it's girls, they will go into these relationships that are abnormal mm -hmm. with all the men mm -hmm. uh, because they're wanting this father re figure or relationship. Yeah. Or, or even the girls that are beautiful, they will just, um, they will fall in love with these gangsters because these gangsters are providing something to them or they're saying words like, I love you, but they beat them up. And you mm -hmm. find that they can't get out of that setup because they are, they are caught up in, they rather have somebody who says loves them than have nothing. And so you find all this toxic kind of setup because of just the absence of that. Now, one key lesson around that I learned was that, <clears throat> No, you know, um, without emotional validation, you know, um, you see, if we don't speak words to children, it is as good as saying negative words. So when you say negative words, such as you're useless, and then you actually don't say anything, even when a child is doing well or anything, it is equal. It is the same thing because you are withholding what rightfully belongs to a child. They want to hear words such as, I'm proud of you. You know, you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are my strength. You know, you are my firstborn and I'm proud and I love you. You know, and, th and most of the time, they don't hear that. They only hear the voice of the father when there's something wrong to say, you've done this wrong, you've done, but they never hear words of affirmation. They never hear anything affirming. So what we do as fathers, we provoke the children to anger. And then once they're angry, you know, they, they become angry. They're not sure you know why. It's because uh, the father is supposed to have the heart turned towards the son. That's what Malachi said. He said, you know, I will send the messenger and he will turn the hearts of fathers to the son. It doesn't say he will turn the hearts of sons to the fathers first. It says he will turn the hearts of fathers to the sons. So the hearts of fathers needs to be turned to the sons so that the sons can basically respond towards that love that they are receiving from, from the father. If that doesn't happen, then you have a void and you have a generation that is that, that, that doesn't know whether they're coming in or whether they're going. So they will look for whatever to draw yeah. out an identity uh, from that. Yeah. So I, I get it, Nishani and uh, and Joshua. I can hear a lot of yeses there, uh, because obviously you guys are relating to what uh, what Tabo is saying. So maybe just share a little bit of uh, just piggyback on Tabo and some of your experiences around what Tabo is saying and how how you manage to fill those gaps. Because uh, Nishani, you've had to step in. Obviously, coming from that uh, abusive relationship. Uh, you've had to step in and, and help Joshua through a very difficult period. You stayed, you know, I want to say that again, you stayed, yeah. um, you know, and that's, and that's a challenge we're having in South Africa. Uh, many are leaving, they're not staying. Um, you chose to stay and you chose to support him. Um, so maybe just talk through a little bit with us concerning that. Yeah, I think it's very important. What Tabo is saying is, is a very critical factor. It is that this nation and this world needs fathering and needs mothering. I just wanna say as a single mom, and I wanna put my hand up for single moms, if you do not have a, a solid role model in, in, your, you know, in your life, please don't go looking for a relationship. God is enough. God is enough and he will make you the parent that you need to be. That's the first thing. Uh, so don't go searching aimlessly. It's not, it's pointless. Um, you know, when Joshua, when Joshua came, um, uh, came on board, came, cl came clean with the truth, and we started to work on this, and it was a 10-year journey, and it's been very rough. One of the things I started to do was I, um, I, I, I specialized in a coaching qualification and then did my specialization in, in addiction coaching to try and save Joshua, and started working with the government at that stage on social cohesion dialogues. I've worked in Soweto and Eldorado Park, um, 
working with over 200 young people, uh, you know, in Vilakasi Street in Soweto. I'm known as Mum Ford. Um, and we worked with 200 uh, youth to re rehabilitate them and to bring them back, to reunite them with their families, you know. Um, these were people that, that didn't, didn't have anywhere to turn. They, they wouldn't even sit in the same room as the, the parents, you know. We had the addicts and we had the parents and they would not even sit in the same room. And so one of the things that I, that I started to do was to use my coaching in the, in the, in the social space and, and to bring together the policemen, the pastors, uh, yes, the policemen, the pastors and the um, um, social workers and to start, start a circle and a system around the addict because we didn't want them to spiral into dropping out of school, having criminal records, you know, all of those things. We wanted to catch them. So when a child was naughty at school or caught with drugs, uh, instead of calling the police, the principal then started to call the pastor who then put him into a mentoring program. And we tried that and we, we had very great results. I mean, uh, BBC News came and made a documentary about our work there in Soweto and Aldorado Park, which we were very excited about. Um, and it also formed the basis for my case studies for the book that I'm, uh, I'm finalizing now. Um, but one of the things that I want to say is that with all the, the intellectual knowledge and the social system and the, you know, Put building the system around the youth. There were these 12 boys that lived in, Joshua, you say the word. In a corn sheet. <laughs> in that, that's where they lived. And basically, what is a corn sheet? It's a hideout. It's a hideout. And it's like a tin place in, uh, like a rubbish dump <laughs> place. Like a rubbish dump place. And I found these 12 boys there. Um, and, and when I went in and, and I said to God, like, okay, these boys look, they, they just like, they like my boys, you know, and oftentimes they would be, you know, drug lords and people, all kinds of people around. So, so these are not places, do people go into conchies? Nobody goes into a conchie, you know, but me, I just thought like, hey, you know, if my son is there, I'm going to get him out. <laughs> so, so with God's protection and with his angels, you know, and, um, and there were these 12 boys and, uh, and, and I wanted to go in and bring in the social services and bust them out and get them all rehabilitated and, you know, all of those things. And, and straight away, the Holy Spirit said to me, sorry, I don't want you to use your, your knowledge here and intellect. I really just want you to mother them. Sure. And I started to go there weekly. And that's how it started. We, we still do it weekly, not with COVID now, but generally we still go out onto the street weekly. Um, and we went, we, we would go weekly. We would, uh, I would meet the boys. I would take my younger son with me, Jared. He's really the unsung hero in our family. We would, whether it was polony sandwiches or whatever it was, we were out there every week looking for these kids, taking them health medication, making sure I had some, you know, some availability on my phone if they wanted to phone, if they wanted to connect with their parents. And eventually uh, we had 12 of them put back into their families and into their homes. And um, I don't know if you want to tell the story of your friend who became the cook, went back to Cape Town. He was 10 years on the street and uh, we got a phone call and a video the other day and he said to me, mom, mom, I'm so fat. Look how fat I've gotten because I'm a cook and he's, he's, he's been reunited with his family after 10 years. Um, oh. And for me, that is the reason that we do. Because, you know, if you look at the stats in the space of addiction recovery, it's so low. It's really low. 5% addiction recovery. Uh, people go back. Even even Joshua, they said there was absolutely no hope. He did an what did you do? An addiction scale testing. He did an addiction scale testing, and they said to us there was absolutely no hope that he was going to come back. This boy was going to die. Um, and I I just really just want to say the reason that we do that we do what we do is because we believe that as long as there is life, there is hope, and we believe in the power of prayer. I'm, I'm surrounded by a praying family. I have seen literally angels move. I have seen how people could not come near me, even in very dangerous situations. Um, and, and maybe it was a desperation of a mother, but um, I really believe it was God, it's God's protection as, as well. Um, and Josh has been, yeah, he's been through a lot. Uh, but what I want to say is that addiction is not, um, it's the reason we want to say this is because we don't want 
people to feel ashamed. We want to break the shame barrier. This is the reason why we talk about this. We want to shape, yeah. break the shame barrier. We want to break because that's what the enemy does. That's what Satan does. This is how he keeps it all yeah. little hush hush. Oh, what mm -hmm. will people say? What we we've we've agreed that we will break the shame barrier. We will break yeah. the taboo, and we will talk about things that people cannot even begin to talk about. You know, we will talk about it because Josh and I go out to families in crisis. We help families in crisis. We we go into very chaotic situations where people are all over the show um, because we believe that we can help build a system around the addict, you know. Um, and so so we work with the addict as well as the family. Uh, we don't just work just with the addict. Um, and that's, I think, where we've seen the success is that we work holistically um, and we work like there's no holds barred. Like I said to Pastor Shane, you can ask us anything, we'll go there, you know? Um, so I think that's that's the main reason. This this is an illness that is rooted in shame because Josh, Josh might have started one making a choice to choose it, but there came a time where he had no choice. He had to he had to chase it because okay. it became a it became a craving in his body. Yeah. 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 I'm loving, I'm loving this dialogue and this platform because we want to name the shame and we want to take back yeah. the power. The moment you name the shame, you take back the power. I'm loving this conversation, Nishani, because I've been sitting in the last two years in almost the same space uh, because yeah. of working with children in, in the South Basin. We started by, uh, by like, like uh, Tabo, uh, not by choice, but starting a crisis uh, intervention for drug addicts. And, and uh, uh, we call them our patients and our friends. We don't stigmatize them. So destigmatizing mm -hmm. is very important. But why I'm loving this platform is the tenacity and the resilience that you modeled as a family. Uh, most parents give up and uh, you know I know there must have been multiple times of anxiety uh, stress uh, financial challenges that come with stuff mm -hmm. missing uh, we had an affluential young man uh, car hijacking his parents wrote him off and like you said when you integrate them back into the family like Tabo is talking about healing happens mm -hmm. and so I called his dad who is uh, uh, actually a, uh, very involved in the political arena into a meeting and I said to him you need to talk to your son and we had a family therapy session and that young man has healed completely and uh, just an amazing turnaround in his life. So I, I really love this. Uh, I love what's happening on this conversation uh, space uh, uh, to your online viewers uh, in Tongat, in Isipingo, in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, you know, somebody got arrested here in Ilovo Beach. I was so shocked that they were manufacturing uh, drugs here in my area and we see it as a safe space. So uh, it's amazing what's happening uh, nationally. But uh, I think we need to uh, call, look for the cause and keep continuously trumpeting the sound. You know, there are so many hopeless parents because every time I encounter a parent, they are crying uh, in the office space uh, with their children and not knowing where to turn. So your story is just uh, uh, a witness to a generation that they can come off it. Uh, mm -hmm. And let's take the stigma off because this doesn't happen just to broken homes. We have very mm -hmm. affluent uh, you have very affluent people. Uh, you have people in Stanton that are working in the office space there and they are using coke and heroin to cope with their high pressure mm -hmm. jobs. And we have wow. patients like that. So uh, excellent sharing of the story. Thabo, if you want to come back uh, and connect to the, the dots here, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about daddy come back home and mm -hmm. how do you advocate? You know, I've worked to focus uh, on parenting platforms for like 10 years. And one of the things I saw on those platforms is an absent father in all race groups. And um, I like the words that you're saying. Uh, oftentimes we focus on intellectual quotient, your IQ. And we, in the church, we love spiritual quotient, your SQ. But we forget the emotional quotient, which is words of words of affirmation, uh, telling your son that you love him. And you know, I have a 25 year old and I still tell him I love him or give him a hug or whatever. Uh, those are real things in our home. And I decided not to continue generational error. So I love that part when you're talking about emotional uh, uh, affirmation because emotional affirmation is important in marriage. It's important with a child and children who grow up with affirmation 
uh, tend to become more successful uh, because they have affirmation. And fathers, uh, as you were saying so rightly, Tabo, uh, they give their daughters a sense of, uh, uh, of a DNA. And so they tend to look at their father as a role model. If the father is not there, then you'll find the first person that tells you, I, I love you, if it's a taxi driver, they're going to settle mm. in that, in that mm. cyclical behavior. Mm. So I love the words of affirmation mm. that you were saying about. And when we must not forget this. I'd love to know how you've overcome that street space, Nishani. But let's mm. go back to Tabo uh, with regards mm. to uh, parenting and uh, daddy come back home. With COVID-19, so many parents are struggling to just have a conversation with their mm. child. And in, in parenting workshops, I always tell parents, you need to ask your child open-ended questions, simply, mm. how was your day? Uh, what did you do today? Who are your mm. friends? And in those open-ended questions, you will find that you're giving your child room to speak. Instead of being authoritarian and instructional, you're being open uh, communication lines and it becomes a beautiful uh, space for communication. So yes, Tabo, let's continue on that same trajectory of yeah. uh, fathering. You know, um, one of the things that I, I believe that also the, the Lord made me to look at was uh, to understand the root of the root of this uh, challenge that sometimes we've got uh, spiritual problems and we try to solve them intellectually but also mm -hmm. sometimes we've got um, intellectual problems we try to do extremes and the this um this this problem you know the roots of it was in in genesis uh, chapter number three the fall of men you know, so we came up with a model, we developed a model in terms of um, a, a healthy home. Uh, after some time, you know, I'd just been looking, wanting to find some sort of a blueprint, something that we can use for family. And so we looked into Genesis 1 and 2, an ideal setup of a family that actually God placed the authority and so much into a couple. Here's Adam and Eve, it's a couple, and he blessed them, and uh, as he blessed them, you know, and he, then they had children. So within that space, you know, as a home, you know, a healthy home, there was a there was a pillar one, which is a healthy marriage, you know, which makes a healthy home. It's, it's a healthy marriage. And the second pillar was obviously effective parenting, you know, um, where your hearts attend to the children and you get a great understanding also of, of them, you know, as you deal with them on their unique uh, characters and their uniqueness, you know, and then also you've got uh, family education. Education was not a schooling system, but it was part and parcel of life. So education is for life. So education, it creates a general basis for life as to say that that's, you know, just where there is a, a, a sense of knowing, you know, how to, how things work, you know, and understanding and all that. And then there was a sense of legacy because God builds generationally. So Adam and Eve have a, had, a, had a responsibility to pass on the blessing you know, to the next generation. And one of the important things that also, that, that I looked at and I studied these families, you know, some of the founding fathers like Abraham, I mean, he was not the first one who was called out of his home. His father was called out, but he partially obeyed. And so Abraham became a founding father. And one of the key things was that in all these families, they had certain habits such as uh, the blessing culture, blessing culture where every Every Friday night, you know, they will have dinners where they bless the, the husband will bless the wife, you know, and, and, and speak words of, of affirmation. And also they will bless the children, you know, and 52 days in a year, or 52, you know, in terms of weeks, you know, and, and they will bless their children. So what that did, that blessing culture, it ensured that they were secured. You know, mm -hmm. they were not distorted mm -hmm. in terms of their wellness. So when you look at wellness, wellness looks at many things such as, you know, your spiritual side. It looks at your, your emotional side. It looks at your physical side. I've discovered most of the sicknesses, they come from the emotional uh, distress. You know, Proverbs talks about it, that, um, uh, that um, too much disappointment makes a heart sick. So you get people on, on stress, on heart failures because of some of the emotional strain they're taking and all that. And it translates to physical health. So some sicknesses people have, they really not physical. They can't find, they can't trace them, you know, but it's a lot of weight in terms of um, emotionally, 
and there's things yeah. that have not been dealt with or it's an absence of words that were never spoken or it's words that were spoken by an uncle you know over years you know to say are you you're useless you you're good for nothing so they live with those words and they create a strain and, and, and even financially, I've discovered that some of the financial challenges are drawn back again to those absence of words because these words were not spoken. So you find somebody struggling financially. It's not that they can't bring in the money. It's just that they don't believe that they're worth it, they're worth it to even have access to that. So they squander it and they do. And, and I think that wellness, what it does, it moves you to a space where you are able to lead. Because a leader, it's a it's a it's a secure servant. So where you serve, not because you serve, you're not ashamed, afraid of serving others, you know, because that's not your identity. Your identity is in Christ. You're serving as as a son in the family, and uh, and you know that you are a leader. And leading is not just through position and all that, and the sense of legacy. So. This problem has been because of the, the often spirit. So I write in the book about the often spirit that the first often in the, in, the, in the world was Adam. Adam had a relationship with his father, uh, with, you know, and they were very close and they had everything. But when, they, when the fall came in, they had to be moved out of that environment and they no longer had a, a direct relationship with the father. So they became the first orphans, you know, and often is not just someone in the streets, in the park, but it's someone who, 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 who really strives to take care of themselves, who, who wants to provide for themselves emotionally, who wants to provide for themselves in many ways. And so they will do whatever it takes to provide for themselves. And so they became the orphans and they suffered from trauma A in psychology, you got trauma A and trauma B. So they had a trauma A, which is they knew what the love of the father is like, what having a dad is like. And uh, most of the people that you meet today, you, you meet a lot of people struggling with trauma B, which is you're struggling with something you don't know. They, 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 they don't know that actually the missing link in their life is the fact that they never had a dad. So they're like, I'm okay. I never had a dad. I don't think I had a problem. But the, but, but the, the symptoms as you deal with them they're very defensive. They cannot submit to authority. They cannot literally, and they're not aware that they, they're struggling from a trauma that they don't even know. And so we have a generation that is struggling with something that they don't even know. I mean, a lot of us in the faith, we didn't even know what it was like to live in the garden, but we were affected by, by, by that. So, so, so we have to understand that it's an often spirit, this thing. It, it's about performance. It's about wanting to be loved. It's about how I'm going to love myself. I'm going to provide myself love. I'm going to do this and this. And Jesus' role to come on earth, it was to break that. In John 14, he says, I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you as orphans. But I will pray that the Father gives you the comforter. Because... That was a challenge. And so the, when the Holy Spirit came, he came so that we can be part of a family, so we can have a spirit that cries, Abba, Father, that says, you know, you're my father, you, you are here. And I think when we deal with these things outside that framework, we tend to fight, fight, fight an unending battle because at the root cause of this thing, there is Father God where all fatherhood is derived. But at the same time, for people to understand fatherhood, heavenly fatherhood, they want to see some sort of a, a earthly figure uh, who can resemble that heart of a father. So the daddy, please come home. You know, we developed a, a, a program called Father Heart Program where we wanted to exhibit the heart of a father, the heart of Father God, which I sum it up in two words, which is gentleness and meekness that's what jesus says in matthew 11 come to me all you worry i'll give you rest learn from me i am gentle and i am meek and that's what paul says in philippians uh, 4 5 he says let your gentleness be evident to all that mm -hmm. we can exhibit this we can learn to be lions that can control their strength and when we are home we, we, we are gentle, we're playing with our cup, you know, we are, we are really there, but we are strong, 
we're powerful, but we know when to uh, love our wives, where we where, when to speak words right in time, speak a word in season, where that scripture is not just for prophesying. It's, it's, it's to know how to sustain your weak child and speak a word in season to say, you know, I love you, to say, wow, well done, to say, you can do this, to say, you actually more, you're actually doing very much and I'm proud of you than to always be provocative. And so these are things we want to look at. So even today, whether you're talking the workplace and sent in Cape Town, men in business struggle with the orphan spirit. So what will they do? They will do corruption. South Africa is run by orphans. What do yeah. orphans do? Orphans, orphans don't know often they're not sure where their next meal is going to come from so what they do they steal they steal so that they can secure their future by stealing because they don't know if they can be kicked out and this is where we, we we're in we're dealing with an orphan spirit and once we understand that the role of biblical and healthy families is so critical we will not be able to deal with some of the challenges i don't blame social development um, I don't blame most of these. Most of the social workers I talk to, they never had debt. They like, yo, you know what? I'm struggling also. And, and, and so, and these are the challenges that I've come to realize that we expecting that they will help, but they, they don't know what to do. And we are here. We actually can provide some of those solutions to them. That's excellent, Tavo. Uh the orphanity is endemic to society. And I think living for a cause goes beyond just being a father to your own biological home. Uh, and also we know you and I were having this conversation that it must not be in the four walls of a church wineskin, but uh, taking on the responsibility of mentoring and fathering uh, the boys. And a lot of the boys at Gems Foundation, they look to me as a father because I take time to talk to them, take time to affirm them, uh, take time to, to go beyond their addiction and look at what's in their heart. What are the gifts? What are their talents? What do they carry? And so it's very important on this platform to, to understand that life has a cause and addiction goes in many, many forms. It's not just uh, um, drugs, but there's uh, South Africans live on tablets and, and pills in our communities, you know, on something simple as pill pain. People are taking 20, 30 women are taking that because of the, the orphanity. Uh, uh, I want to look at that resilience that you have there, uh, as a family, how, how, how did you come out of that, 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 that season? You know, it takes a lot of tenacity then, Nishani. Yeah. I think yeah. Pastor Shek will talk about that, but it takes a lot of tenacity. Uh, I see a lot of parents just give up. They just give yeah. up. There's, the boys are sleeping in Chatsworth, they're sleeping on the street. There are boys in Isipengo, they're sleeping on the streets. And parents have given up. So what kept you grounded? What kept you focus because I'm sure our online viewers want to know that uh, because right yeah. now some mother is wanting to call. I, I seen a mother call uh, uh, the police for her son over 10 times uh, because he was in and out of rehab, in and out of rehab and carjacking and stealing and all of the time. And those are real things. Parents are going to go through that. Uh, this is a reality. We're going to be very open on this platform because mm -hmm. okay. it's not just a spiritual platform. This is a platform yes. of help. It's a platform of aid. Mm -hmm. So how did you navigate that? Uh, where where yeah. did the not giving up come from, uh, Nishani and and you, Joshua, how, how did you, how are you sustaining yourself now being three years sober? Because some guys relapse very quickly. I, I had a, a, a gentleman stay there for six months and then went out and had a cider over the weekend and just relapsed on cocaine. Uh, but thank God he's fine now. So uh, back to you guys, Nishani and Joshua. Yeah, firstly, I just want to say, if you're one of those parents that, uh, that have washed your hands off your kid, um, there is no judgment for that. I completely get it. I completely understand what that, that is like. It has been, uh, it, it was something that I could have considered for myself. Um, I have a, uh, we have a family creed, I guess. Um, which is? All 1,000 times stand up. Yeah, and we, we have made a promise to each other that even if we fall a 1,000 times, we will stand up a 1,001 times mm. in every area, not just uh, not just in the terms of addiction, but in every area in our, in, in our lives, we won't give up. We're going to go in screeching into those graves. Um, yeah. And so we won't give up. And, you know, I live by the, I live by the mantra, if you want to call it, that love never fails because God never fails. And yeah. I, 
I was, I was, my God was not going to fail. Mm. I have driven in places looking for this kid and speaking to the Holy Spirit and hearing angels say to me, turn left, turn right, and there I find him. I remember the day that from rehab. I ran away from rehab. And uh, she, I don't know how she found out where I was. And, because the police couldn't find me. But out. she came and she just pulled up next to me and I'd had the, I had a stolen TV and a golf club in my hand. And she was like, beep, beep, get in the car. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> No, we love, but, uh, but but really, I think for me, the, the the reason that I didn't give up was that as long as he had breath in his body, I was going to find him and I was going to bring him back to God because I I knew that Jesus was Jesus. And if God is God, if, if, either I have a faith or I don't have a faith. Either God is God or God is not God at all. And for me, it was as black and white as that. Yeah. And wash her hands with me and let me decide to yeah. to make my own decision because she had tried <coughs> I think I've been to about 11 rehabs on hospital yeah. a lot of rehab psychiatric so at a stage it was that I was on my own and I had to come back and make my own decision to come to rehab you know yeah. so it's no place of... yeah I, I had to close the door I had to lock the, the gate in my home and I had to say to him well if, if you, you're over 18 now I've done my bit uh, if you're going to choose this there's no home for you uh, and so that was the time that I that I closed the door and I let him live on the street of course I went to the street every week he had a street name his street name was uh, Jeezy Jeezy and I would look for this Jeezy everywhere um, sometimes my sister would come with me and she'd, she'd open the window just a little bit because she's like, what are you doing? This is so dangerous, you know, so, so, but, but, um, uh, I was, even though he was, he was, I told him that there was no home if he was an addict, um, and he had to choose between the drugs and the family. It took him 11 months. I thought it would take him two days, but it took 11 months. And that in itself is heartbreaking. And it's, uh, the only way that I think that I survived that was, you know, the Bible says, make my heart stout, Lord, make it strong, you know, and I think that, that God did that, and my relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, uh, with the fact that I've, I've seen angels being commissioned into places and into dark spaces, um, and, you know, Joshua and I, we have a very open communication, I, we have a business together as well, we also have a, have a catering business together, Yes, with, with Joshua's fiance. And I mean, he's also a coach. So I do some of the coaching supervision. So he's done a coaching qualification as well. So, uh, I mean, what makes it okay to work together? I don't know. You say. I think communication. We don't have a problem communicating. And I don't think we've ever had a problem communicating. Even in my addiction, I could come out of rehab, relapse, and be like, oh, mom, I'm on crack. I need help again. Like, so our whole life we've had very open communication, I could say. So now it makes it easier to be in business and to live together, to to communicate. It yeah. makes it easier to communicate. But, but we've had, yeah, I some, yeah. And, and I think we've had some hectic conversations because one of the things is that, I mean, we you can't just bring back somebody after 10 years. So yeah, I mean, just... I have a, my youngest son left home when Joshua came home. He left home for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've had to have some real open conversations about grace, forgiveness, safety. We've, we've really had to dig deep um, and fight to be together, fight for each other. Oh, I love that. In Nehemiah, it says that you must fight for your family, fight for your husband, fight for your children. And what I'm hearing, you know, this is an answer to prayer, Pastor Shane, because this week I've been thinking about striking an advocacy group on gems just because of drugs, because I'm seeing it's over ravaging our communities yeah. in such good homes. But one of the things that Nishani, you said is very important, it's called tough love. And parents yeah. have to practice tough love. When you practice tough love, it doesn't have to be in, in, a, in an addiction environment, but in any environment where a child uh, breaks the boundary without recognizing that there's a parent figure there, then we talk about tough love. In the simple thing that Tabo, uh, in our parenting workshops, is, and you probably do this with your children, uh, you ask them to sit in the corner, you know, or uh, it's corner time. You know that there is uh, a comfortable 
there is freedom with every responsibility. That's the word I was looking for. So every responsibility, even a five-year-old has, or a 12-year-old has, or a 21-year-old has, there is responsibility and accountability with that freedom. Uh, and, and I think that's so important. Uh, I love uh, the conversation. And one of the things, uh, Nishani, uh, parents struggle is when their child is, uh, I know we have a family therapy session, when they leave their facility, is uh, the whole idea of trust with finances, you know, uh, oh, trust, yeah. with, uh, trust with the bank card again, trust yeah. with the money. So we tell yeah. parents, give it a year or two, don't just rush blindly into it. Because there's going to be there's going to be areas where they that uh, uh, finances is a temptation and a, a bank card is a temptation. So close that door to that because you're protecting that individual uh, and and helping them through the season. So you know uh, this is helping so many people right now, and I'd love to continue this conversation yeah. somewhere because I know in my city I know there's a place. Uh, uh, in, in KZN called Cliffdale, almost all the, the, every home has a drug addict there and they don't know what to do anymore and they burned down the homes of the drug lords. It was on ENCA and they still yeah. can't help them. Yeah. And Gogos are crying every day. Mothers yeah. are crying every day and there's a sense of helplessness. So yeah. a lot of South Africans need to hear your story and continue the success, uh, Josh, because uh, your, your kind of, your kind of sobriety is going to help others to say, I can do it. It is possible. Yeah. And we'd love to see your sobriety in 10 years, yes. into 20 years, uh, because it's going to help you uh, grow yourself. Uh, mm. I think ultimately, Josh, because God has a plan for your life. You know, I started off from Jeremiah and, 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 and the prophetic is that before you were formed, God knew you. So if you had so much of tenacity mm. to kick your mother in the, in the womb, mm. then God... <laughs> some things through society and ready to give back uh, to South Africa uh, because we need to collaborate so that we see transformation, national transformation on this platform. Yeah. Yes, Pastor, sorry. Yeah. I just yeah. it. You know, you know I, I, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I, I, I just got to absorb the conversation uh, because I loved what I'm hearing. Um, uh, Pastor Shailen, I, I woke up yesterday morning um, uh, with a cry in my spirit mm. and this was the cry. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I and that that carried me throughout yesterday. Even at this moment, you you don't know this conversation right now what it's doing to me in my spirit as as far as what what's happening. Um, I love what Tabu has been speaking about uh, with regards to the breaking of mindsets concerning men, um, yeah. and it's not just about being this macho man. Yeah. It's sure. about having this humble, mm. uh, love, attitude, mm. coming down to the level of your children yeah. um, and, and being able to interact with them and having those real conversations like Nishani and, and Joshua. I've been talking about the real, authentic conversations mm. um, that you could have and that you could share. Um, and to be able to come to that place, what, what Tabo has been speaking about, about the man and addressing the man as to who he should be. Uh, because the man is supposed to be the strong man. Um, and when you present weakness, um, you know, it's taken in a different context uh, or you looked at uh, differently. Uh, see a man that will rise up like that um, and love unconditionally uh, to be able to come back home and be there uh, for the family. I think this is another generation of men that's rising up at a time like this. And we have to. To, to be able to deal with the spirit of orphan across our nation. What we're looking at, 65% uh, of children have no fathers at home or they, they, they're absent fathers, let's put it that way. Um, and so that's where the challenge, and that's been one of the significant moments in Joshua's life. Um, and it's brought them through so much. Um, and, 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 and then we talked about the resilience of, of Nishani. I think Nishani takes resilience to the to another level. Um, you know, not just to not just to fight for your son, mm. but to be found in those uh, secret dens, uh, and not just being there for your son, but looking I, for oh friends, right? Mm. Come on, but looking for the son's friend to to be able to take them out, and now to have um, to have one of these one of his friends go back to Cape Town and send a message back to you and say, "Mom." 
you know, this is what I'm doing. This is what I've achieved. This is what I've accomplished. Yeah. I mean, that that's an amazing story. And, 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 and that has to encourage somebody here today. Um, yeah. I want to take that further in just a few minutes. Um, I want to take this further quickly because, you know, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky says this. He says, the mystery of human existence lies not in just, a, not just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. Yeah. yeah. Joshua, you yeah. know, when you were 10 years old, you, you sought out this drug that you thought could take your life. In, in 10 years or so, you've turned your life around. And now you're looking at how you can make a difference in somebody else's yeah. life. Mm-hmm. Just for a moment, as we try to wrap up tonight, talk us through that. You as a young man, 20 years old, what? What causes you to move from where you've been to where you are now? Now you're trying to help other people. What causes you to move across to this place where you are now giving life to somebody? You know, what, what, what's the trigger? What's the starting point? Uh, what makes you uh, see life the way you see it now to be able to touch somebody else's life? Um, Nishani, you can come in as well. There, please help, help you know, help us here because we're not just talking about somebody who survived, yeah, mm-hmm. or is surviving. Mm-hmm. We're talking mm-hmm. about somebody who is going on to live life abundantly. Yeah, yeah, you know, abounding. Mm-hmm. Uh, come on now, wholeheartedly. Yeah. And so, so I, I think just as we try to wrap up this evening, I don't know how we can wrap it up, but let's try and close it up with that maybe. Guys, just share, share with us, please. You know, why, why take on a cause? Why go wholehearted? Why go now and, and try to help not just addicts, but try to help families? And I know, Nishani, you can share about why you, we, why you are doing this. So, guys, quickly, just, just talk to us about that. Well, uh, I've, I've seen what addiction did to my family for almost two years. Right? We didn't speak, like, we didn't talk to each other at all. You know, it was just I want money and then. I'm out of the house or we didn't speak at all. And it destroyed my family completely, it tore us to shambles. Um, addiction also took me down a very, very dark road. You know, I'd been through hell and back. So when I got the when God gave me the opportunity to get myself out of there, I just thought, why not help other people not have to go through what I've been through? Like mm-hmm. why? Prevention is better than cure. So why I've been stabbed, but if if I know someone else is going to get stabbed, I don't know if they're going to survive it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't want that on my conscience. So I'd rather prevent it from happening than try to help him afterwards, you know? And in my addiction, I've lost a lot of friends. A lot of my friends have been shot. A lot of my friends have been stabbed, have overdosed. So now I don't want people to have to go through that. Like I've been through the most. I don't want people to have to go through that. And I've got a little daughter now. So if I can get drugs off the planet before she turns into a teenager, it would be much better. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe speak about, just tell us a little bit about what happened six months ago when you were uh, picked up by, by the police. Oh, yes. Incorrectly, by the so, way. <laughs> I've, in my addiction, I wrapped up a couple of warrants of arrests and charges against my name. Um, I've been to prison twice. Um, and then when I had come out of rehab and stuff, the cops found out where I was staying. They came to pick me up for three warrants of arrest. And then all the charges were dropped against me. Now, six months ago, somehow miraculously, one of the warrants reappeared and they picked me up again. And Mm -hmm. I had to spend the whole weekend in the holding cells. But it was different, you know. I I mean, I was with people I knew, people were smoking drugs and and I wasn't even tempted to go and smoke drugs or fall into my old ways. I was actually tempted to tell the guys like, you know what, gents, there's a better way of life than this. I mean, on Monday, I'm not going to prison. And I know that for a fact. Mm-hmm. Like I am going to turn, and I mean I was praying with the guys there and stuff like that, and it was different for me. I mean I've never been to a holding cell and prayed before in my life. 
<laughs> so it was, a, it was different. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool. And you came home without a shirt. Oh, and I gave my shirt to someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that uh, Pastor Shannon alluded to was, was the fact that the financial accountability is so important. It's not just financial accountability, it's every kind of about accountability. I have to, I know Joshua's triggers. I, we have agreed and contracted how I will call him on it when I see him. Uh, three years later, he still comes back with slips. I have to check the slips. I, I have an in contact on my phone because okay. I mean, he's just not in the bank card now, but I have the in contact on my phone. And if he says to me, I'm buying X, Y, and Z, and I expect him to spend 100 Rand and he spent 150 Rand, he has to account for that. Everything is accountable for. And it's hard work as a, as a single mother and a full time, you know, because I mean, he's, he should be able to do that. But, but we have that system in place. Um, and the reason we do it, and sometimes, it's, it's like a couple of bob extra or, you know, 50 rand extra. And, and then he goes, oh, mom, but, you know, there was somebody that needed peanut butter and, and bread at the garage and I couldn't walk away. But here's the slip, you know. And, and, and that's the kind of accountability we have. Um, and it's not just for that. If he, if he is triggered, I understand what his triggers are. I understand if he's sleeping in late, if he's not making his bed properly, if, he's, if there's certain signs and, and I have the right to call him on it because he said to me, mom, if you see me slipping, addiction is a behavioral disease. We've got to change the behaviors associated with it. Behavior changes when we change habits. And if I, don't, if I see him slipping in, in his habits, and that means not doing his chores or washing the car, whatever it is, um, I call him on it. And, he, and, and I have complete right. He's told me, mom, just call it straight, you know? So I have to call him on it straight. So it's hard work. It's hard work. Recovery is a daily is a daily thing, and recovery means that we give account to each other. You know, it's been three years, and it is getting easier. But but we have a strategy. So if we're going to a wedding, this is what we do. If we're going to a bar and and there's going to be alcohol and there's going to be X, Y, and Z, this is how we do it. This is my sign, mom. Mm -hmm. If I need to if I need to exit, this is what we're going to do. You know, so so we plan for recovery. We have those conversations. Um, church is a part of that, his relationship with God, Bible reading. Just, you know, the one thing is, like I always say, Joshua is a pastor. He, he knows the word like that, you know. And that was the one thing that survived on the street was the Bible. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a family event or whatever, recovery comes first. Yeah. If I'm uncomfortable, I leave. It yeah. doesn't matter yeah. if it's a funeral, if, it's a, if there's alcohol or whatever. And I feel uncomfortable or I feel triggered. I just say I'm out and I go. Yeah, and, the, and there's no questions about it. So we have a strategy, we talk about this. Um, it is part of our life. Um, and if he had diabetes, we would be talking about this, his diet, his exercise, all of these things. So we treat it like that. One of the things also that I wanna say to you is that I have advocated in the judicial system. And you know, uh, countries like Italy, as an example, they treat addiction as a disease and not as a criminal issue. I have advocated in the judicial system for Joshua and for many young people, uh, written letters of the to the court, spoken, <laughs> written to state, you know, state prosecutors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have, we've worked hard with the judicial system because I advocate for that, and I really want to see. Um, it moved from punitive justice to restorative justice, you know, um, that is what I want to do. I want to change the bills in this country and you know, the laws, you know. And so one of the things is that I'm very grateful that Joshua stays, the, you know, he has no criminal record. He's completely clean off the ju judicial system. So it enables him to get work. But there are many children who don't have a mother advocating for them or somebody advocating for them. And I can't keep quiet. I can't. I won't. They, that's somebody's yeah. child, yeah. you know? and, and we can say, oh, you can make a different life and you can choose differently. But if the system doesn't support the person, how are they going to yeah. change? If all yeah. of us don't come together, and, and Pastor yes. Shailen, I'm very happy to share with you my the model that I developed for, for the community work and the social cohesion. Well, I'm just very excited because- Yeah, uh, I get too excited. 
I want to jump up and down. Two things that you said are very important is number one, oftentimes when there's an addiction problem in a family, they don't see it as family work. They see it as the individual working and trying to recover. Yeah. But yeah. family work is yeah. critical. That, the rest of their lives, that family will have to work with that individual, even if they have recovered completely. Even that spouse has to work with that partner. Yeah. That's yeah. the first thing. And the second thing we talk about uh, our love is that many of them have a criminal record and they want to exit drugs. But when they get back on the street and they're street smart, they don't think there's no way out of them. Unemployment. Is, is, is painful. And so they start to feel useful, useless as well. So there's no cause and there's no purpose. Yeah. Like Miles Monroe said, where purpose is not established, abuse occurs. Yeah. So I think those are important things. I think to wrap up there, uh, Tabo, maybe talk to us about how can we escalate uh, daddy coming back home uh, on a macro level in South Africa, just to uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. sum up this conversation based on Yes, I will contact you with Pastor Shane's permission there. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, one, one of the things that we discovered, so I have a Children Act book from mm. South Africa, so I went through it in and out, and I noticed that the, the one, most of the time the process, you know, even for children to be plucked out of the homes, what will be somebody notice there's some disorder in a home and then they report it to social development. Social worker has to come assess, file a report, and then this is the key. They have to recommend an intervention, intervention <coughs> program. So if the intervention is not working, then they'll have to pull the child out into a place of safety. Um, and, and then from there, a court order comes. They put a child in a foster home or in a rehab or in some way and wherever. And uh, I realized that in that way that system is done is that if the interventions that are designed are working, you wouldn't have to actually pull the children into a place of safety. So it means, number one, the interventions are, are flawed. They're not yeah. working. And uh, if you look at the act on its own, there's, there's a budget that should be allocated by the, by, by the MEC of whatever province uh, to, to go into intervention programs. And to choose those intervention programs, then there has to be benchmark in terms of how, what, what are they doing and, 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 and all of those things. And, and, and you find that this is where the challenges are most of the time that uh, there, is a, there is a framework in terms of how you could engage, but the implementation of mm. such a framework, you know, this is where the problem is. So even when it comes to escalating these things, you know, um, if you look at um, the different care, such as alternative, different alternative care and the different thing, I've always maintained this, that children belong in a home. Uh, yeah. All of these, um, even even in the act, it does say that there has to be the goal has to be reintegration with family or reintegration with society, and you will find that if there isn't, if that's not the goal, then the interventions, you know, they, they get a problem on its own. So what we've seen as Daddy, please come home, was that we then set up what we call Daddy's Home Education. So Daddy's Home Education. We call it a resource center for families, where mm -hmm. we, instead of looking at a child individually, we are saying it's not the child who's the problem. Uh, the problem is the whole family. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the family mm -hmm. is a problem, but the problems are in the whole family yeah. because yeah. the child yeah. is a reflection of what's going on in the family. So it's mm -hmm. either there's something going on there that is not healthy. So if you bring an intervention, bring an intervention that looks into family wellness. Yes. So we now talking about things like family wellness. That's why I talk about a model of what is a, a healthy home, you know, different alternative. Mm -hmm. If there is a, a father and a mother, if it's a single mother, there are different reference points in terms of how you can get, you know, the mom working with the children. The story of the widow uh, uh, and the oil is a beautiful story of a mother who actually had a beautiful, who, who restarted a business with his children and they worked together and they became one of the most powerful empire there, you know, just selling the oil. So, mm -hmm. so it's not that it's, it's over, but you want to look into those. And when we talk family wellness, we're talking wellness holistically, 
that yes, mm -hmm. you, you want to look at things that are spiritual, but you want to look at things emotional. But in the end, they all translate to, to physical wellness, to financial wellness. And this is where the most of the time when you look, homes have been broken because number one, there is a, yes, there are systematic issues. Uh, the reason I went to Marikana is because the man that died there, it was a systematic, it was a structural issue where men go to the mines and in the mining there, there isn't proper housing conditions. So men stays in hostel, they can't have their families come over. So they end up here sleeping oh. with a um, prostitute and they get either children or they get girlfriends. Yeah. And then you get these children that are born there that are often, the job is gone, he goes back home, he closes his phone, he changes his number. That creates offense and you got a problem there. It's structural, yeah. the system is wrong economic wise and it's forcing men to leave mm -hmm. homes to go there and the, uh, the second yeah. part you've got a generational problem where it's if it's generational it, it's because uh, there, there isn't a sense of being intentional as men in terms of saying this is a healthy family this is how it should be either we don't know how a healthy family should be and number two there are examples, but we're just arrogant. We don't want to go and land. We don't want to go and be mentored to go to a family that is doing well and find out what makes you guys to be healthy and walk with them so that mm. at least you can get a new uh, education to pass on a right legacy. So we, we get those things. So I'm saying uh, we, we need to look into the interventions that are there, that they mm -hmm. should not focus on the child you see we you see we've got a children act yeah. why don't yeah. we have a family act yeah. you, you, yeah. you know why you know why we don't have a family act because there's an argument in terms of what is a family number yeah. one because yeah. of uh, other conversations yeah. around adam and adam and steve or, or yeah. susie susie and susan and, and, and that's why there are issues around that. I sat in a meeting on family and there were issues around that. I mean, you can have two dads, you can have two moms. It, it's okay. This is why there isn't a family because there's an agenda. Also, ideologically, we are flawed. Uh, Marxist is, Marxism is really running the country. So we will not have a family act. And that's where we will need to start. Present a bill, have family act where we're looking, correcting that. That's one. And so once you look at family holistically, then you are able then to confront issues of uh, what a proper marriage. Already, you know that ma a marriage is no longer Adam and Eve, you know, that's number one. And, and we have different issues around that. And number two, when you look at children's rights and all that, children actually have more rights than, than, than the parents. Yeah, that's you know, true. Than the parents. It's, that's again, it's flawed. How do you entrust a child with so much rights when they are not in the age of responsibility, what do they know? Mm -hmm. about? Yeah. So you got a challenge there, and you got so 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 you have a, a lot of challenges that stem out from not having that proper family uh, wellness site. Yeah. So we've designed that, mm -hmm. and we've pulled together different skill sets right. to form what we call a table of support. We are saying each and every family to have a normal family, you need to have a table of support. A table of support will be made of the parents, uh, where there is a dad. So if there, if there isn't a dad, you must find an alternate dad. Either it's a, it's a male figure that will play that role. Par and then you'll, need, you'll, you'll have a coach if there is a sports that's done or it's dance, a dance instructor or whatever. But you'll need to have a social worker you work with, you know, and then you'll need to have a, a family therapist or a psychologist. Or you will need to have some sort of a support doctor, a family doctor of which whenever there are issues, even as a single mother, you can be able to say, I need an, an intervention here. I need help here. So in that way, each and every family can have a benefit of that structure. So we pull in these people together to say, if we target five families, we can ensure that we can provide them with this table of support that they can have. We might not stay with them, but we will not, number one, pull out a child out of their home. We will bring in this table of support into mm. the whole home mm. to say, yeah. where are the gaps? Here's an intervention. And it's not just a program, but it's an intervention process because we understand it's a journey. Then from there, you have a balance of legislation, but also practical. Right now, legislation was 
as long as we don't have a family act or something that, mm. that has issues and practical wise, the interventions have to look into family wellness rather than just uh, rehabilitating yeah, that, yeah. that boy. It must look at holistic uh, yeah. development. And in that way, you have something you can roll out even practically from churches, from these rehabs organization, from these foster homes. Their whole idea is that in the end, we would like you to be reintegrated with your family. Most people don't want to be reintegrated with their family. You go to prison, they'd rather be in prison than to go home. You know, they'd rather be in a foster home than to go home because homes are not healthy environment. And the enemy has targeted homes and that's the yeah. revival and the reformation we need where yeah. we have healthy homes where you want to be safe and you know that you are loved. It doesn't matter what happened outside, but you know that you can run home and you are safe at home. So that's my thoughts. Fantastic. Uh, Tavo, thank you so much for sharing that. There's been some amazing uh, concepts and, and insights there concerning the family and, and, and how we have to bring restoration. You know, Pastor Sheridan and I have been sharing a lot about the reset uh, button that's been pressed on the earth. Um, and one of the aspects is the reset of families, bringing the family unit back to the original pattern uh, and the blueprints of God. Um, and so if we can get the family right, then we then obviously, because the family plays such an important role in society and societal transformation. And so if we can, if we can get that right, um, so you shared some very important components there. And uh, we want to really say a big thank you to Tabo uh, for all of your thoughts and, and for doing the work, the sterling work that you're doing uh, and uh, the input in society um, and making a difference. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to you and coming on the platform tonight and sharing with us your thoughts. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, God richly bless you and your family as you continue to press on, press on for the cause. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and then to Nishani and, and Joshua, uh, you guys are amazing. Um, and we want to say thank you so much uh, for sharing tonight. Um, you know, I'm, I, I was reminded as Nishani was jumping up and down on the seat there, and, and then Pastor Shailen was doing the same. Um, I, was, I, was, I was reminded of something that Pastor Nell uh, shared with us uh, last week, Wednesday. He talked about how the starting point for any cause is a burden that will be placed in your heart. And I can see that in Nishani. Um, you know, I see the burden, I see the passion and the drive uh, to do something about that burden. And so stay on that course, Nishani. You're yes. doing an amazing job as a mother, first of all. Uh, but now, you know, to go and make, make a difference in society and to these young boys and young men as well. Um, so well done, Nishani. And Joshua, well done on, on three years. Uh, we, we're declaring that you will keep, you will stay on course yeah. and that you would finish well, mm. that you, there will be no hijacking, there will be no distractions and you will know how to finish strong because the power uh, uh, that comes from above, the open heaven is in your life and, and that grace, that oil, fresh oil will continue to flow into your life and the, the anointing uh, to be able to, uh, to be able to not just survive, uh, but to thrive. And now as you're moving on to business and doing all of the things that you're doing, um, God's going to give you great success. Yes. Um, and he will turn, you know, one of the statements that we always talk about is turning our mess into a message. Mm -hmm. I see that. Mm -hmm. doing, I see God doing that in your life. Mm -hmm. God's turning a mess. Maybe your situation has been a bad one for the last 10 years, but God's turning that around. And you have an incredible message that you are taking to other young men and to other families as well. So keep on, uh, keep on moving on. Pastor Sheridan, you want to round up and, and uh, we can wrap up today. So we thank all our online viewers for tuning in on this incredible concept of uh, changing cities uh, through the dialogue and the platform of bringing hope. And tonight, I just sense that there's, just, there's been an activation of hope. Uh, the scripture says hope deferred mm. makes up. But there's an activation of hope through the live portals on this platform. Uh, just a prophetic impression, Nishani, that um, 
as a woman that God's granting you grace like an oak tree and many young individuals will build branches, uh, build nests in your branches and they will take uh, uh, counsel and wisdom from you. It's gonna expand and it's gonna, mm -hmm. it's gonna have maximum impact in ways that are gonna be beyond you. There's a, there's a shift of jurisdiction, there's a shift of authority and something's happening in the realm of the spirit. So we trust in God that he'll work with you guys. And with uh, Tabo, I just see the Zaya 54 position of stretching the cord. And that's what God is doing. And it's going to be a season of great capacity, of great influence. And all of these things will manifest in full measure in the season. So thank you all for tuning in. And uh, I think we're going to continue this conversation somewhere along the line mm -hmm. because so many South Africans need this conversation. They need uh, mm -hmm. I found today one of the most significant conversations we've had on this platform. We've had many, but tonight has just been special uh, because I see the touching and the impact of many lives. Uh, God's healing the brokenhearted. Yes. And I pray today we yes. that God will heal the brokenhearted. He'll set at liberty those in captivity. And we thank God for Tabo. You know, we don't have to be in four walls. And it's a new normal. A men of God wear many hats and they're not stuck behind their pulpit. So thank you for pioneering. Our spiritual father teaches us that he's been teaching us for, I think, 20 years that we are, we are to have dominion in every domain, impact the marketplace, transform society uh, through our obedience. So thank you for tuning in. And God bless you and peace to you, Pastor Shane and Rita, for hosting this amazing portal and platform. May great grace be upon you and your family tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. What an awesome time together. Um, Ishani, I think on behalf of all the mothers and women out there, you are a woman of such strength and resilience and I, I you know it's being a mother but being a single mother is just another level altogether um so I, I like the word that has come over your life I believe that there's so much more in store for you God will continue to grace you everything that you've been through in your journey uh was just not gonna be for in vain uh, but there's so much more to come. And even Josh as well, it's not how you start, but it's how you finish. And we believe that he will finish strong. As he uh, fathers now, it's a different level for him as well. So, uh, you know, when, when, we, when we hear of these stories, it's not just a story. It's not just um, something out there, but it's so real. And so tonight, we just thank God, you know, that has the grace transferred here, the people that are listening to the viewers. Uh, it's not over yet. There is a way and there's a better way. You know, God will give you insight. He'll give you foresight. Um, if you just ask for help as well, because there are people that can help as well. So um, even Tabu, God bless you as well. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, thank you to every viewer. Continue to tune in and stay together with us as we keep building. Uh, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. God bless you. Bye-bye. Good night. Shalom.